wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and only there is no one like you there is none beside you open up family, I'm Michaela, and I've got a few things to share with you. Zoom meetings are happening weekly for both middle school and high school. So if you know a student who is in need of a hangout and some Jesus, then contact Pastor Jordan for more info. Also, to stay up to date on the church app, subscribe to a notification group specifically for middle school or high school. Finally, if it's your normal habit to give on Sunday mornings, I want to challenge you to continue your worshipful act of giving using our online tools. Setting up an account with the new giving platform is easy. Just tap the giving button and follow the steps to set up your account. And of course, you can always mail your tithes and offerings to our church office. And now it's time to turn our attention to God's word. So grab your Bible and let's join Pastor Dale for the message. Hey, good morning, everybody. 
Today we're in Luke chapter 22, verse 63, and we're going to go into the next chapter looking at how Christ was unjustly treated during his trials. When I was in elementary school, I was brought into the principal's office one day. Well, what happened was a group of about 10 to 20 boys would play this cruel game, chasing and catching this one kid that was really fast. Um, but the hunt would range from the playground through the tetherball poles, across the basketball courts and the breezeway, through the woods and the sports field. And finally, when they would catch this kid, they would pin him down on the ground and the largest one would sit on him. My friend and I, uh, we were nice shy kids and we felt bad for that kid getting chased by this crowd of elementary school kids. But one day, while the chase was on and, and they were passing by, me and my friend, the playground lady blew her whistle. Everybody stopped. She was so mad. And so she sent all the boys to the principal's office. Get to the principal's office, she said. As we watched justice finally being done on behalf of this poor mistreated kid, as the scolded boys walked by on their way to the principal's office, the playground lady pointed at me and my friend. She said, you guys too. And we <laughs> kind of looked at each other, but we didn't do anything. And she said, I don't care. Get to the principal's office with everybody else. And so we were caught up unexpectedly in this cruel crowd. And as we stood before that principal and he yelled at us, I was scared. My face grew red and hot with embarrassment. And I felt like screaming out, but I'm innocent. Well, as we look at Christ's story, Jesus was innocent as well, but he was still treated like a criminal. In Isaiah 53, 12, it says, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He was caught up with the transgressors with this cosmic act of injustice. Jesus was arrested, tried, accused, and condemned to death. Have you ever been misunderstood, talked about behind your back, faced open hostility even, or false accusations? Whatever kind of injustice you've suffered, we have a God that can relate with us. Jesus can relate and sets for us an example to follow in the midst of injustice. There are six trials of Christ that began around 2 a.m. when he was arrested. They were completed by 9 a.m. that morning. Three were before Jewish authorities. Annas, the um, high priest, Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who was the current high priest at the time, and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. There was an injustice with that first set of trials because according to Jewish law, no, no one was allowed to be tried as a criminal before daylight. Also, they weren't allowed to be beat as a criminal before the trial. And so we see they violate both of these laws. Three of the trials after the first three are before Roman officials, Pilate, and then Herod, and then Herod sends Christ back to Pilate. We see this great injustice in these three trials because though the leaders saw nothing wrong to condemn Jesus, they crucified him anyway to please the crowds. And so Christ was hung on the cross by 9 a.m. Well, let's pray before we get into the passage today. Lord, we ask that you might show us the injustice that you endured, not just because of the cruelty of man, but because of your love for us. And I pray, Lord, we might understand the passion that you have for your people that you died for as we look at these words today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so first, we're going to look at Jesus being mocked at the high priest's house. It says in verse 63, Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. And Matthew adds this in Matthew 26, 
67. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Peter had just denied Christ three times, and that was an emotionally painful experience for sure, but there was much more to come. As they blindfolded Jesus, which was so cruel because it prevented him from using his reflexes and anticipating and protecting against each blow. Really, as they began to mistreat Jesus, mocking, beating, verbally abusing, and even blaspheming, Jesus had not been officially declared guilty, but the soldiers were permitted to abuse him anyway. Now, the irony in this situation is that he did prophesy. Christ prophesied that this actually would happen to him. As they're hitting him saying, prophesy who hit you, we remember Luke 18.32, where it says, For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. They mocked his supernatural power, which, by the way, he could have used against them in any moment. As they asked, Who hit you? He did know their names. He knew each of their life stories. He knew the number of hairs on each of their heads. He was aware of every sin that they had ever committed, yet he didn't say anything. The innocent Lamb of God remained silent, being abused by this angry pack of sinful men. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You see Christ's self-control contrasted by the loss of control by these guards. The King of Kings chooses to suffer unjust treatment willfully for you. Those who identify with Christ, as we'll see today, should expect no different. The second thing we see is Jesus being led away to the Jewish council in verse 66. It says, When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Christ is now in his third trial before the Jewish leaders. He stands before what's called the council here, which is the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council composed of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. There were 70 to 72 members from the most influential people in Jewish society. They exercised jurisdiction in civil and religious matters, but they had no power over life or death like normal government or over military actions or taxation. The Romans had all that power, but the council, on the other hand, had jurisdiction over these civil and religious matters. This council was unjust in their actions towards Jesus. They denied him the rights guaranteed to every Jew. They violated their own rules of legal protections and processes guaranteed by law. This trial is what you could consider an illegal trial because of the beatings and the methods used. They had their own version of the Fifth Amendment in that day, but they prevented Jesus from being protected by it. This Fifth Amendment, so to speak, prevented accusers from being forced to testify against himself. But here, they're setting Jesus up for that very thing. This is a mock trial, decided to condemn him before the trial ever began. 
In this trial, Jesus' identity is described with three titles. Notice this. It says, first of all, that he's the Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah, meaning anointed one. The Jews were waiting for a Messiah from David's line that would restore the kingdom of Israel. Jesus was the Christ. He was also called the Son of Man, which is a messianic title found in the book of Daniel. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed." So Christ is called the Christ, the Son of Man, and then lastly, the Son of God, a claim that would make him equal with God, which was considered blasphemy. Notice what he says. He says to his accusers, you say that I am. He doesn't deny being the Son of God, but he uses their very words to reveal who he is. Anybody that claims that Jesus never claimed to be God hasn't seriously considered these passages because the very reason Jesus is condemned is for blasphemy, a man claiming to be God. And in that, he was just testifying to the truth. The council didn't have the authority to sentence a man to capital punishment. Only the Romans possessed that authority. But the Roman leaders could not sentence to death anyone on a theological basis. So the council had to come up with new accusations. And that's what we'll see next as Jesus is brought before Pilate in chapter 23. So let's look at that in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 23. It says, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up people teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea from 26 to 36 AD. That put him in charge of collecting taxes and keeping the peace. Though his headquarters were in Caesarea, he was in Jerusalem at this time during the Passover to help prevent trouble while such a large number of Jews were gathered in one place. Pilate was hated by the Orthodox Jews and made no effort to understand them. His relations with the Jews had been rocky up to this point, and he was under the magnifying glass with Rome because of that rocky relationship. Eventually, there were serious accusations made against Pilate, and he was banished to Gaul, where, according to tradition, he went insane and committed suicide. Now, pagan historians, such as Tacitus, mention Pilate, but only in his connection with his sentencing of Jesus Christ. They bring three accusations against Jesus to Pilate, which is different from the charge of blasphemy, which they want to put him to death for. Instead, they're attempting to get Pilate to sentence Jesus to death for three things. The first we see is misleading our nation, which would be disturbing the Jewish peace, which Pilate would be interested in keeping that peace. So they're trying to push his buttons. Secondly, they claim that Jesus is forbidding people to give tribute to Caesar, which if you've read the gospel, you know it's the exact opposite. That tribute was a payment made by people to one nation to another as a symbol of submission and dependence. So not paying tribute was the first sign of a rebellion, and they were claiming Christ was trying to start a rebellion through that claim. 
saying that he himself is Christ a king is the third thing. Saying that he was a king would be in direct rebellion to Rome. Now, Pilate doesn't fall for any of these things. He only seems interested in the third charge because it could indicate a rebellion to Rome. So that's why he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And again, Jesus doesn't deny it, but he's using Pilate's own words by saying, you say that I am. Now, John's gospel tells us in John 18, 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Now, when Pilate heard that, he said, I find no guilt in this man. He might sound a little crazy to the average person, but there's nothing wrong with him. Pilate didn't buy their arguments. He didn't see Jesus as guilty of capital punishment. And that moves us on to the next trial before the Gentiles, and that is that Jesus is sent over to Herod in verse 6. Then Pilate, when Pilate heard this, that Jesus was from Galilee, that is, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he had learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Now, being in political hot water with Rome, Pilate took the first opportunity to pass Jesus off. And in this case, to Herod, who had jurisdiction over Jesus' hometown in Galilee. And so Herod receives Christ and puts him on trial. Herod is Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. This Herod is the guy who beheaded John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And now, up to this point, Pilate and Herod were rivals. Herod's main headquarters were in Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, but he's in Jerusalem under obligation to attend the Passover feast because he was a nominal Jew. Now, he had long desired to see Christ, it says. He heard of the wondrous reports and wanted some sort of entertainment. He wanted to have Jesus perform some miracle before him. You know, everybody wants to see a miracle. Soldiers, they said, hey, prophesy. And Herod is asking for some sort of sign. Um, miracles don't produce faith. They actually reinforce the need to see more miracles. Many had already seen miracles and they still wanted more, but they didn't believe in Christ. If you read the book of Exodus, Pharaoh had all sorts of signs, but his heart became hard the more that he saw. Israel saw miracle after miracle, God's deliverance, crossing through the Red Sea and God providing food from heaven. They even heard God's voice audibly, but they still rebelled. You see, it comes down to the condition of the heart. We must humble ourselves, admit sin, and turn back to God. And in that place, we will find Jesus Christ. He questioned him, it says, at some length, but he made no answer. Jesus doesn't respond to the questions. Though Herod plies him with many, Jesus didn't speak at all. He had rejected the message of God so many times, Jesus didn't bother speaking because Herod wouldn't hear. Herod's Hard heart resulted in God's silence. So in a sense, Herod wasn't the one judging Jesus. It was the other way around. God's silence was a judgment towards Herod. In verse 11, And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod 
and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Herod joined in the mockery of Jesus. It wasn't just the guards at this point. It was Herod. He put an elegant royal robe on Jesus, which was a robe that was either white or purple, the colors of royalty. This was a mockery of Jesus's identity as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Interesting that Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that day. Their rejection and mistreatment of Christ created a bond of demonically inspired fellowship. You know, there is a fellowship between those who rebel against God and mistreat Christians because they have a common enemy. The same is true when two people gossip about the same person or have a common hatred. And we see that at work and in justice today. And that brings us to the last trial before the crucifixion where Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified. In verse 13, it says, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, Nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. In all this, neither Pilate nor Herod found Jesus guilty. They said that he did nothing deserving of death, which reveals what the religious leaders and the crowd were pushing for in the first place, that Christ would be killed. And so Pilate decides, I'll punish and release him. That although he doesn't find Jesus guilty, uh, he'll have him illegally beaten in order to appease his accusers and keep the peace in the crowd. Now, perhaps he also intended that to serve as a warning to Jesus, not to become a bother in the future. And so I think Pilate thought the matter would be finished after he beat Jesus. In verse 18, it goes on, But they all cried together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas. A man had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them at one, once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! crucify him. At this point, Pilate was in a pickle. Pilate was consistently portrayed in Luke's account as wanting to release Jesus because he believed him to be innocent. And so in this pickle, on one side, he had his wife trying to convince him not to convict Christ. In Matthew 27, 19, it says, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. God was sending a message to Pilate. Don't do this. He's the righteous one. On the other side of this pickle were the Jewish leaders. And they were saying in John 19, 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him because the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. And so they were pressuring Pilate, saying, we're going to tell on you. You're going to get in trouble with Caesar. You're already in trouble with him anyway. Pilate's career was at risk. He wanted to please the Jewish authorities more than he wanted to please God. He feared Tiberius Caesar more than he feared God. The Romans were known for sacrificing justice for peace when it came to Israel. Roman soldiers could be killed for burning a religious scroll, not because it was against Roman law, but because his death would silence the outrage of the crowds. So it, injustice would be carried out just to keep the peace. So in Pilate's mind, the only thing that could bring peace was injustice, to crucify Christ. And so he was convinced by the voice of the crowds. 
instead of listening to that still small voice. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Pilate feared man more than God. And we find another character introduced, Barabbas. He was a known criminal who had been convicted of his wrongs. He was a danger to the Roman Empire. He was actually guilty of insurrection and murder. It had been proven. He was thrown in jail. He was going to be convicted of capital punishment for it. He represents the kind of Messiah that Israel was hoping for, one that would fight the Romans. On one side, you have Barabbas, this man guilty of insurrection and murder. On the other side, you have Christ, the innocent Lamb of God. Salvation either by insurrection and murder or salvation by sacrificial death and resurrection. Which savior would they choose? Now, it may have been a tradition to release a prisoner during the Passover, but that didn't mean that they were to punish someone else in his place. But that's exactly what Pilate sets up here, a choice. The crowd yells, crucify him. Jewish leaders were calling for crucifixion, but also this mob mentality took over the crowd. In Matthew 27, 18, we're told that Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. You know how horrible. The Jewish leaders were just jealous of Christ because of the miracles, because of the crowds that were following, the teaching, the authority that he had. Pilate knew what was going on behind the scenes, and he alone had the power to take a life or to spare a life. Pilate tried washing his hands because he wanted no part in what was taking place, but there's no amount of water that could wash, wash off the guilt that we have as sinners. In Matthew 27, verse 24, it says, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children, which in itself was a prophetic utterance, not realizing that Christ's blood was poured out for all of us. In verse 22, a third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Pilate still had Jesus beaten before the crucifixion. In John chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, it says, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves. And crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. At this point, Jesus was beaten so badly, Isaiah said in Isaiah 52 14, as many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. 
it was his hope that after seeing him beaten severely that the Jews would let him go, but they wouldn't have it. Three times Jesus was declared not guilty by Pilate. In verse 4, verse 14, and verse 22, Pilate still surrendered Jesus to their hostility. The crowd still crucified him anyway. It was an unjust arrest, unjust trial, an unjust conviction. People have tried to figure out who to blame for Jesus' death. Was it Herod? Was it the Jewish leadership, Pilate? Was it the crowd? Well, let me suggest that it's all of our fault. Jesus was willing to die because we are all sinners. It was my sin that put him there. He suffered all this injustice for you. Will you receive Christ as your Savior today? As we close, there are three things I think we can take away from Christ's example here and apply to our own lives. The first is that Jesus suffered injustice for you, and therefore we suffer injustice for him. There was once this 19-year-old Alaskan man who was attacked when he tried to tell two strangers about Jesus on a bike trail in the Anchorage area. He says he went out for a walk around midnight after returning home from a revival meeting at a nearby church where he had rededicated his life to Christ. He says, I was asking God what was next for my life. Just before 1 a.m., as he was walking around, praying and seeking the Lord, he encountered two young men walking on the trail. And so he introduced himself and began talking about Jesus. And he says, I told them, I'm going to tell you guys two things. Jesus loves you, and he has a plan for both of you. A little bit into my testimony, I got sucker punched, he says, and hit a couple times. Then one of the men pulled out a gun and asked, where is your God now? And the man shot the 19-year-old in the arm. Fortunately, he wasn't seriously injured. He was treated at a local hospital and released, but reflecting on the incident, he says that God was present. If my God wasn't there, I wouldn't be alive to talk and keep going. Have you ever experienced unjust treatment because of being identified with Jesus Christ? Now, many of us suffer injustice for a lot of reasons, but when we consider that we would suffer injustice for being identified with Christ, that brings injustice to a whole nother experience. It's to be expected that those who follow Jesus will suffer injustice as Jesus did. In John 15, verse 18, it says, If the world hates you, now that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember that the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. We who call Jesus our master should not expect the world to treat us better than him. So the question is, knowing that Jesus suffered injustice for you, will you be willing to suffer injustice for him? Will you stand for him as he stood for you? And so there's the first challenge I think we can take away from this message, to follow Christ's example and return that love that he has for us by loving him and standing for him in a hostile world. But secondly... Another thing we can take away from Christ's example is to live like justice is on your side. You know, it's one thing to be on the wrong side of justice and to be convicted and, and to experience punishment because of that wrong. But it's good to know that there exists a good judge, a God, who is all-powerful and will overcome with his justice. 
Even though we look around in this world and all you got to do is watch the news to see the injustice all around us and it can get frustrating. But know that it will not last forever. His justice that was once against us because of our sin, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. That is his judgment. But now because of what Christ did in experiencing the judgment of God on our behalf, we are on his side when it comes to justice. His justice is for us. Now that should transform our lives and give us confidence in a world that is against us. God's judge justice is for us. We've been forgiven much and therefore we love much. We've received much mercy and therefore we give much mercy. Following Christ's example when you're treated with injustice should be something that we begin to pick up over time as we live for him on this earth. In 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Notice what Christ did. The confidence that he had in the midst of injustice was that he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He lived like justice was on his side, and therefore should we. When we're humiliated, we can find a refuge in a God who can say, I know exactly what you're going through. Jesus was completely innocent, yet he was convicted as a criminal. He had done nothing deserving any of this horrible treatment. He loved people. He served everyone. He sacrificed a life of comfort to minister to the needs of others. He healed their sick and he taught them the truth. And instead of being honored, he was hated. Wearsby says this about Christ. When men were giving their worst... God was giving his best. That is the God that we have. When men give you their worst, follow in the footsteps of Jesus. He teaches us these things. If you're experiencing injustice or being mistreated now, think about these verses. Luke 6, 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Luke 6, 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. So if you want to look like a child of God, then and act like a child of God, then we act like God in the fact that he is merciful to sinners. Romans 12, 21 also tells us, do not be overcome by evil. Don't let it get to you, but overcome evil with good. Our reply to hate is not more hate, but it's the love of Christ. And the last thing I think we can take away from Christ's example of suffering unjustly is that we can trust that our vindication is coming. We, we will not suffer injustice forever. One day at a youth camp, as we were gathered around for dinner and we were all enjoying our meal and then came time for dessert, bowls of chocolate pudding. They came out in these large bowls and then they had a serving spoon in them so we could serve it into our little bowls in front of us. And as I was so excited to eat this chocolate pudding, I was getting ready to serve some up. And from behind me 
came a hand filled with chocolate pudding that was smashed into my face. And so at that moment, I thought, okay, this person's going to get it. And so I stood up. I was getting ready to run. As I turned and saw the girl running away with a bowl in her hands, and God spoke to me real quick and said, vengeance is mine. And so I stopped and I sat back down just as she tripped and got chocolate pudding all over herself. Now, Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know, that was just one little way God taught me that truth. There will be one day a day of vengeance. God's justice will be satisfied and our suffering is going to end. We are going to be vindicated by him. When your reputation is smeared unjustly, maybe somebody has been saying bad things about you that aren't true. Remember Psalm 62, verses 7 through 8, and I've turned to this psalm many times throughout my years of ministry when people have misunderstood me and falsely accused me, and it gave me great hope. And it says, On God rests my salvation and my glory, which could also be translated honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in, in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And so as we are suffering injustice, that's who we turn to. Instead of reviling in return, we pour out our heart before the Lord, find refuge in him, trust in him at all times, and he will bring about our salvation and our honor in the end. Because God vindicates his children. He's always faithful with his justice. Jesus was vindicated at the resurrection and the ascension, though he was numbered among the transgressors and killed on a cross between two thieves. He was vindicated as the son of God where death had no power over him and he was taken up to heaven. We'll be vindicated as well. In Romans 8, 16, it says... The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. You know that you're a child of God when you suffer like Christ did because you're identified with him. In the same way, that we suffer for him, we will also be vindicated or glorified when he returns. So unjust suffering, don't be discouraged. Don't be conquered by the enemy's schemes, but rather find your refuge in Jesus Christ and God the Father. His justice is on your side. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for being the perfect example through unjust suffering, may we walk in your footsteps. Whatever situation we face, even in this moment, some sort of gossip or misunderstanding, in some way we just want to scream out, I'm innocent. Lord, we pour out our hearts to you in this moment and we trust you with the results, with the future vindication that you may bring. And God, if there's anybody listening that needs to be on the right side of justice, realizing that they're like a sheep that has gone astray, that they would pray this prayer. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and dying for my sin on the cross. I call out upon your name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, save me. I am a sinner. Help me to follow you all of my days. Thank you for this new life in you. And then now I've crossed the line and your justice is on my side. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this online gathering. Take some time in personal devotion or with your loved ones to review the discussion questions at the end of the video. Thanks again for worshiping with us. See you next time.